Right, assalamu alaikum and a very warm welcome to Game Changer. I'm Tayyab Anasar Khan, your host for today, and we will be talking about two very, very significant topics. One topic was very recent, and of course the other is very recent too, but the one topic which we will talk about, the first one, is of course APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. And of course this has 21 member states, and this one, the current one, in 2023 took place in San Francisco in US under the chairpersonship of Joe Biden himself. And many countries participated in the APEC as well, and there were a lot of dialogues. Their basic aim was creating a resilient and sustainable future for all, putting highlight, highlighting and putting this uh, spotlight rather on the sustainable future. And sustainable future does not only mean environment and climate, which of course was very much focused on, but it also means other aspects, which are ensuring supply chain, and also ensuring the economic participation of all the APEC countries and the world over. Moreover, the wars that are currently happening right now in the world, two major wars, the Ukraine-Russia war, as well as the Hamas and Israeli war, rather, you would say, the Israeli war on Palestine was also discussed. But of course, before coming on this topic, we will be talking about another topic as well, which of course brings a limelight to how India had been putting Pakistan in their perspective when the IMF and the FATF deal were going on. Of course, we know that India currently, a violent extremist group collects funds through the organized networks, according to the global financing watchdog FATF, and that was put under the highlight. And of course, we also know that India could be put under the blacklist as well because of this particular reason which they were blaming on Pakistan. Very interesting how karma works, I would say. But of course, before we go on to our first topic, and of course later on the second topic, let me introduce you to the guests of today. We have been joined by Mr. Shahriyar Khan, who is an analyst and of course the director of a democratic organization as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Right, we have also been joined by Ms. Naila Chohan. She has been the former Special Secretary of Foreign Affairs. Thank you so much for joining us. She's also the ex-ambassador of Pakistan as well in different countries. And online, we have been joined by Dr. Hasnan, who is an economic analyst. Thank you so much again, Dr. Hasnan, Ms. Naila, and of course, uh, Mr. Shahriar for joining us all today. Of course, we've been talking about APEC for the past week as well. The information war has been going on. The security war has been going on. But, but most significantly, the economic war somehow has been going on as well. And this was talked because of the presence of Xi Jinping, the Chinese president in uh, San Francisco. This brought a very significant conflict uh, on the world stage and a means of cooperation as well, because that's what it is. So my first question is to Mr. Shahriar. APEC just happened. There were 21 countries participating, two giant economic powers of the world, US and China, facing off each other and also trying to develop an arena of cooperation. How do you think it went about? So, Tayyiba, um, if we look at uh, the key takeaways from the APEC conference this time around, the APEC summit, which hmm. uh, it's like dubbed as, so this has to be viewed in the backdrop of a lot of like international events that you talked about in your introduction. So right now, we're uh, now moving into a post-pandemic world, a uh, world that is devastated by a lot of like damage caused by climate change. Other than that, a lot of like wars that have like broken out. The Israeli war against Palestine, as you mentioned. Other than that, the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict. So in the backdrop of all of that, and like the go global power politics between the US and China. So if we view this summit from that lens, one of the most important key takeaways from this conference is the four hour long meeting that took place between President Xi and President Biden. And after this four hour long uh, 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 meeting, a lot of like uh, um, key aspects were discussed between these two economic superpowers, a lot of like geopolitical issues, a lot of like trade related issues, and a, a lot of like uh, cooperation in terms of economic means hmm. that were like discussed. Hmm. Other than that, over 21 countries uh, from the Asia Pacific were represented. And these are all like big economies. They represent over 50% of the global GDP and trade volume in the world. So all of these countries are very reluctant and have a pessimistic view of the way things are like going in the world in terms of economic cooperation, in terms of like free trade, trade agreements. The world is moving more towards protectionism 
and uh, you know now that there are like a lot of different geopolitical centers emerging in the world hmm. a lot of like cooperation is at stake hmm. other than that the devastation caused by climate change hmm. and international politics was also uh, discussed in these meetings so like four key areas that were like discussed the joint declaration that came out which was also dubbed as the golden gate declaration so they talked about supply chain diversification uh, climate change and sustainability other than that uh, harnessing technology for development and a lot of like risk associated with ai artificial intelligence as well so these are the four key areas but again if we view it from the lens of international events that are taking place in the world i think it was very significant Right, thank you so much, Mr. Shahriar, for talking about this. But of course, ladies and gentlemen, we know that creating a resilient future for all also comes at the cost of creating a peaceful world for all as well. So, Ms. Naila, I'll go towards you as well. Um, the fact that creating resilient future means a peaceful future means, for of course, sustainability, means that there is a shift in the relation between China and US. We've seen that. The competition is rising. And the Indo-Pacific policy has changed. It was earlier, of course, the Asia-Pacific policy. It's become the Indo-Pacific policy as well. And the recent APEC meeting comes in the backdrop of this. And we've seen that more other uh, economic frameworks are being signed between, for instance, Tokyo and U US back in May 2022. So how do we create this peace and resilience to bring a sustainable future in the terms of global security? Well, uh, Teva, you have uh, basically alluded to a few things in the backdrop, talking about Asia-Pacific converted to Indo-Pacific. That was done once they established Quad, which was quadrilateral uh, security dialogue, uh, including USA, Japan, Australia, and India. And uh, then uh, the rivalry on Taiwan because uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan uh, really created a big impediment in progress of uh, relations between these two countries. Even their militaries had stopped communicating with each other, which was dangerous because uh, if they don't communicate, anything can be misunderstood and can escalate into war. But in the APEC summit, firstly, that uh, fear was addressed, and both sides, both leaders, it was actually before the APEC summit hmm. that President Xi and mm, President Biden met, and they agreed that the military-to-military -military communication should be resumed. Uh, but uh, in the backdrop of the wars like Gaza, Ukraine, uh, the supply chains, as Sherryar was talking about, has been disrupted. Hmm. So uh, now we have to look at how USA is trying to play its cards. Because when you listen to what uh, President Biden said, uh, he said that we are going to uh, do de-risking, diversifying, hmm. but not decoupling from China. That means they are still coupling with China. <laughs> And yet, uh, they want to de-risk and diversify right. their trade. Hmm. So uh, they are basically, as they call strategic ambiguity, hmm. uh, that USA, you know, uh, professes when it comes to its relations with China. That continues. But I think uh, APEC summit was a good platform to de-escalate the tensions uh, that had uh, come about in last two years. A very significant platform to de-escalate the relations uh, that were, of course, souring in the past few years as well. But we have seen that Ms. Naila and, of course, Mr. Shahriar, they've both talked about a very significant aspect, which is the global supply chain. And this comes on a backdrop of the security threat that the U.S. is feeling from many different uh, Chinese-backed organizations, applications such as TikTok, such as Huawei, which have, of course, been banned as well in many capacities. Uh, Dr. Hasnan, the fact is that Xi Jinping himself talked about protectionism with the business leaders in his meeting. It was a very long meeting with the American leaders uh, and the businessmen over there in the US and Los Angeles, uh, in San Francisco rather. Uh, so what do you think is the future of this global supply chain when in fact there is a backdrop of the 
sanctions that are carrying forward and the chip wars that are carrying forward as well? Yeah, before I mean, I answer the specific answer about the chip war, I just wanted to take you to the uh, I mean, broader uh, perspective of the APAC. So uh, if I talk about the commitment to the APEC Putrajaya version, uh, I mean, uh, the Putrajaya vision in 2040 was ensured for an open, dynamic, resilient and peaceful Asia-Pacific community by 2040. So this meant take action uh, for the prosperity of all the people of the future generation, including through the implementation of the IOTA plan of the action, which we call it AP APA. So and the Bangkok goal of the biocircular green economy under the APAC uh, 2023. So theme in this year, advancement have been made through three policies priority. So what has been taken by the President Xi and what is taken uh, given by the uh, President Biden is interconnected, innovative and inclusive. So now under th uh, these uh, three priorities serving the regional economic initiative have been discussed, including all these areas. So number one is renewing the term of the reference for the Asia Pacific model for e-port network. And the APEC is uh, alliance on the supply chain connectivity, regularity, and the harmonization of steering committee. Uh, EPIC Health Science, then they are talking about the harmonization center, then they, they are topic, uh, uh, talking about the WTO is very important and the core of this uh, whole uh, discussion. Otherwise, uh, there, there would be no economic balance uh, uh, without talking about the WTO. So the APEC free trade agreement uh, or the trade area of the Asia Pacific FTAAP, what we call it. So EPIC disaster risk reduction framework and uh, action plan. And third was the uh, food security for the roadmap, of, uh, roadmap toward the 2030. To stay at least the APEC summit has resolved the several similar initiatives, including uh, the one that I just mentioned, all of these, and the one target to enhance the regional economic res uh, resilience and instability. And the second is, it is very interesting. The, your, uh, the second part of the question is very much in, important and interesting. It is interesting to note that uh, throughout our 2023 EPIC host year, the United States worked with the EPIC economies to support the sustainability through the focus on just energy transition, building the digital specific by advancing the digital skill and connectivity, and, the, uh, and of course, promoting the resilience and inclusion by the meeting the momentum on the trade and investment gender equality, food security, anti-corruption is very much important in that part, and that both of the leaders are uh, discussing on that matter. So uh, by, by keep, uh, keeping in this matter, uh, un under the review, note that the forget the EPIC member have invested $1.7 trillion in the US economy. What you are asking about is the whole of the business community in China, uh, in, in America, a powerful uh, member of the supply chain, powerful member of the business community, powerful member of the uh, business, whole of the business supply chain is from the China. So this is very much important. Uh, uh, rather to create the problem uh, of the competition, they are come out of the competition and they have to accept that we must have to focus on the conflict resolution rather than the competition. So it is very much important in that part. So economy supporting some 2.3 million American jobs and U.S. companies in turn have invested about 1.4 trillion in APEC economies. 2.3 million Americans are also taking advantage of the APEC-related business opportunities that are coming up as well. And of course, you highlighted green energy and the sustainability in this regard and the energy, renewable energy as well towards uh, the transition towards that. I'll, I'll go back to Mr. Shahriar on, on this. Uh, we were talking regarding green energy and the transition towards the clean energy as well. We know COP28 is coming up as well. And of course, all the countries that are present in the, were present in the APEC, all the 21 countries will be a part of the COP28 as well. So was there any collective decision of bringing AI and innovation in the clean energy transition? So, uh, Taiba, the key takeaways or the key discussion points on COP28 COP would probably be on how to basically institutionalize or how to basically kickstart the loss and damages fund. So that is like one area in under falls under climate finance, which is like something very controversial, and that is something that is not taking off. So most of the discussions around COP28 and the commitments from the global north, the countries that have produced the most amount of greenhouse gases, and how they would be able to compensate the developing countries if they want to incorporate an agenda of uh, climate sustainability, they would need finances. Finances in the forms of grants rather than loans. Because as we see in the global financial architecture, the countries of the global uh, south are already very heavily indebted 
to the global uh, countries of the global north. So that's like one area. Actually, I would like also say like in the declaration that came out of the APEC, this was the only area where there was uh, complete harmony. Hmm. There are like other areas which are controversial. There are like a lot of countries have like different uh, takes on how uh, whether AI is uh, you know um, how to basically go about that technology, and the ethical tendencies, ethical issues, and everything. Mm -hmm. So every country has their own take on it. When it comes to climate change and sustainability, I saw that there was like a lot of like consistency mm -hmm. and a lot of like cooperation in this regard. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of the countries again would be looking for. Uh, some sort of like commitments from the countries that are developed or countries that have like a very high GDP if they want to like contribute hmm. or some sort of like commitment on operationalization of the loss and damages fund. Hmm. So that is like one area where all of these countries which basically uh, amount to around 40% of international trade can uh, very constructively play their role and uh, become global leaders in curtailing the devastating effects hmm. of climate change. So did we see any uh, point or any declaration uh, point which was related towards the circular economy, for instance? So um, when it comes to discussions and the uh, declaration that came out, so we don't know a lot of like details, but like obviously there is consensus when it comes to climate change and sustainability. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure like there like there have been like a lot of discussions on circular mm -hmm. economy, development of green economy, mm -hmm. on uh, climate finance, because all of these uh, you know uh, measures that are needed to curtail uh, further decay from uh, global house gases mm -hmm. or to move towards architecture or development or industrialization which mm -hmm. is more sustainable in nature mm -hmm. a lot of like finances are needed right so it would be very unfair on part of the global north to expect all of these changes and all of these uh, um, uh, sustainable technologies to just like magically appear with the countries of the global south mm -hmm. they're going through massive uh, uh, devastations from like floods from high temperatures from uh, melting of glaciers and all sorts of like devastation that we're like seeing Hmm. When it comes to global wars, uh, even though they're not induced by climate, but there are like international food security right. insecurities that are emerging because of the uh, conflict between Russia and Ukraine. There's a whole uh, crisis of like grain, grain. and, uh, you, you know, that is like affecting countries of hmm. Africa. So holistically, I think the onus or burden lies with the global north hmm. on to develop some, so, some sort of like sustainable architecture, hmm. financial architecture that could basically play a role in um, changing the whole dynamics of the global south. Right, changing the whole dynamics of the global south, but we do see that APEC countries, a lot of them are from the global south in itself mm -hmm. as well, especially mm -hmm. the uh, Latin American countries and the East uh, Southeast Asian countries as well. Going to Ms. Naila Chahan right now, of course, uh, we've talked regarding food security and of course the global grain crisis that ar arose after Ukraine was unable to export its grain to the world, causing a huge shortage of food as well. And current uh, conflict of Israel and ha Hamas, I wouldn't call it a conflict of Israel and Hamas, I would call it an outright war of Israel against the Palestinian people as well. So these issues were discussed in the APEC meeting, and these countries which are in APEC are much likely the stakeholders of many international decisions as well. Russia is present, US is present, China is present, Japan, Korea, etc. So is there a way that they will further develop any cooperation to try and de-escalate the conflicts? Because we did not see any clarity on the situation in the current APEC conference. You're very right. There was no clarity in the current APEC uh, summit. Uh, but uh, subsequently, you're aware that uh, the foreign ministers of certain Islamic uh, and Arab countries were invited by the Chinese foreign minister and they had a meeting in Beijing and now they're going to have another sequence of meetings uh, to discuss the devastation caused by the Israeli aggression. And I totally agree with you, we shouldn't call it Israeli-Hamas uh, you know, conflict. It is actually Israeli-Palestine uh, war where Israel is the perpetrator of uh, devastation there. So uh, it seems from the reports that uh, President Biden did speak to uh, President Xi Jinping about uh, Iran also. Um, because as you know, the Houthis are also mm. active and now so many players are coming into action. So if this war 
is a ceasefire doesn't take place and this war escalates, it will uh, embroil many other countries which the world can ill afford. Right. So uh, the proactive diplomatic uh, uh, initiatives that China is taking uh, are very important. And as you can see earlier on also, unthinkable was Saudi Iran, uh, you know, rapprochement. Mm -hmm. But uh, they developed those, uh, revived their relations. So I'm optimistic that with Chinese diplomacy, uh, we may be able to bring uh, a halt, a ceasefire to this aggression and help those people because until you have peace, supply chains will continue to be disrupted, right. whether it's oil, whether it's wheat, whether it's any other thing. Hmm. So peace in the world is imperative for economic development. It can't be sustainable otherwise. Right, right. Uh, Ms. Naila, we'll, I also want to ask another question, which is very different from the current question, which is regarding Korea and Japan. There was a side meeting, there was an event in the university which happened and the, both the presidents spoke over there as well. So we can see a budding cooperation between the two countries under the umbrella of US support. Uh, do you see an effective role of both the countries' cooperation within APEC and of course in global economy? Definitely because Japan is a very big economy itself and uh, this initiative is equally important when we are talking about South China Sea and Indo-Pacific. Mm. Uh, peace there and economic development there will affect all of us. So in that context also, it's uh, an important initiative. Right, and Mr. Sharyar, how do you see China in relation to this dynamic relationship that's building up? So Taiba, I'm like very confused when it comes to this whole, um, you know, dynamics of the US when it comes to Indo-Pacific. Because if you look at the new national security document of uh, the US that mm. came out like I think like it's been like two, two years now, mm. two or three years. So that like document solely focuses on the Indo-Pacific and it also establishes the Quad. And most of that national security documents basically focuses on curtailing China's rise. Mm. And then we see a lot of like protectionist policies being adopted by the US when it comes to semiconductors, when it comes to high tech technologies. Mm. We saw a lot of like friction between Chinese companies and the US companies, the whole rollout of the mm. 5G program and a lot of like Western countries uh, uh, canceled their contracts with uh, Huawei, uh, with like the Chinese uh, state owned enterprises as well. Mm. So there's like a lot of like competition or I would like say there's like a lot of like protectionism. So this like whole uh, uh, summit and the four hour long meeting between President Xi and uh, uh, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, focused on easing these tensions. And uh, China, uh, under the leadership of uh, President Xi, also hosted a dinner for American business leaders right. as well. And uh, a very famous dinner, a dinner in which like it's uh, boasted that every plate over there will costed like $2,000 $2, for a ticket to basically have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with President Xi. Mm -hmm. So a lot of like business leaders from the US, they basically use those opportunities to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with I President Xi. I would do Xi. that if I were there too. <laughs> exactly, to like see. And they also kind of like complained that because of this whole geopolitical global competition, China in retaliation is also uh, implementing protectionist policies, mm. which the U.S. businessmen mm. see as uh, some sort of like, uh, you know, uh, uh, ease of doing business is being cur curtailed. Mm. So that was like also China's way of uh, easing the tensions mm. between the businesses that are operating from the U.S. and they're investing heavily in uh, mm. China and uh, trying to ease the global economic tensions. And uh, another uh, important statement that came out uh, from J President Joe Biden was, that the world cannot afford the two largest economies being in consistent friction. Hmm. And cooperation between these two economies would hmm. be good for the international economy. So I think the intention is there hmm. and how the frameworks of cooperation will be developed, we have like yet to see that. Right, the frameworks of the cooperation being developed is something we have to see. But of course, there's a security dynamic as well in economics always because there is the probability of Chinese security companies uh, spying on many malwares and spying on the 
um, uh, U.S. and Australian um, uh, definitely government officials as well as per the U.S. and Australian legislations that have come up. Not the legislations, but the statements by the legislators that have come up. But let's go towards Dr. Hasnan and talk regarding this and bring this conversation a little further as well. There is, uh, some many say, that there is a corporate espionage going on as well. Of course, we talked about semiconductors. There is a chip war going on, and there is a trade war going on between the U.S. and China. How do we go forward? How we, do we ensure that this actually de-escalates and the protectionism somewhat ends as well? That is perhaps a very important question, um, a very pertinent question. Actually, the corporate espionage in the chip war, that is the core of the whole issue. And so now, so this statement was extremely important, in my opinion of you. So Biden has once acknowledged the policy of uh, trade uh, it has with the China, and these will not be resolved overnight, but there is some sort of normalization on the table. Now, you can see the little normalization on the table. So the actual statement reads, we have real differences with Beijing when it comes to maintaining a fair and level economic playing field and protecting your intellectual property. Now, this is the underlining uh, important point, is the protecting your intellectual property right. This is very much important, and this is the core of the APAC meeting so this referred to many indicates and claim of the corporate espionage and corporate espionage you must know that i mean it has been the allegation by the americans to the chinese that there is a corporate espionage and uh, you have seen that even uh, uh, president joe biden indicate that this car uh, what uh, president uh, 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 president xi jinping shows that it is very similar to the cadillac <laughs> well this is on the lighter note but of course, the claim of the corporate espionage, the chip war, and the ongoing trade war between the two countries. Now, the U.S. has shown on the intention of the softening the trade barriers or uh, uh, strict policies Meyer and has placed for the China. So, now, on the other hand, Beijing is reported happy uh, with the overall Biden and Xi interaction, and the newspaper here uh, continued to report uh, the overall interaction in the positive term, which is very much, very much, uh, uh, I mean, positive sign for the whole world. But beyond the optic of the first meeting in over a year between the leader of the world, two biggest economies, not awful lot of have changed. There was nothing suggest, uh, just a question with the uh, inverted commas, reset in the US and the China relation that in the recent year have been uh, rooted to the suspicious competitions. For the country like Pakistan, that implies that the Pakistan can seek economic and trade relationship with the, both the US and China. But it will have to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, treat as a carefully but quickly to gain the maximum economical and financial gains. So as because of the part of the, I mean, we can take the maximum profit from the national security policy 22 and 26 and invasion of the uh, 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 pragmatic shift from the geo strategy to geoeconomics. But we have, I mean, as Pakistan is coming from the geo strategy to geoeconomics, which has important implication for the maritime policy planning and Islamabad history of the maritime blindness, which a scholar attribute to Pakistan policymaker, land-oriented impulse is also responsible for the lack of Pakistani participation in shaping the discourse. Now, the Pakistan Navy chief, the naval staff, recently acknowledged a great focus on Pakistan maritime economy, which will lead the Pakistan region on East Asia 2023, which seeks to invigorate with the a South Asia through the ASEAN. And ASEAN is very much important, and the vision East Asia is very much important, and then the Indo-Pacific, which is the finding the increasing world uh, acceptance. So moreover, if I talk about the total alliance, uh, the, uh, like I said previously, beyond the optics of meeting, that there was nothing to suggest reset, and there is a much, uh, I mean, you can say, uh, the talk about the WTO. So WTO is very much important in that part. The system has been a huge part of the region. Uh, I mean, incredible growth. APEC is the uh, uh, looking to the reform of the WTO because if there is no transactional balance between under the WTO World Trade Organization, that could not be the uh, I mean a permanent part of any solution. So Pakistan environmental solution is the different part. Energy sector is a different part. But of course, the whole uh, what we call it. Uh, the uh, inclusion of the trade, which is more than uh, 41 million American jobs depend on trade, job uh, uh, tied uh, to trade uh, tend to pay in the 15 to 20% higher wages than those don't. 
and nearly half of the every American manufacturer producer is destined to export market and in fact about 6 million of the 13 million American employed in manufacturing owe their jobs to export. So similarly, uh, about 25% of the U.S. farms product to buy value are exported to each year, by which farm export reached to nearly $200 billion of the uh, fiscal uh, year. So this means that a lot number of the uh, economy is dependent on China. So tr let's try to understand how much China is way too important for America, and America is way too important for the China. America and China are interdependent no matter what happens. And of course, thank you so much, Dr. Hassan, for very beautifully summing up all of this as well, bringing in what the WTO stands for within the APEC as well. And of course, the impact all of this could have on Pakistan as well. Very significant to note that post-pandemic um, economic development and the supply chain disruption that was caused, and now it's, it's um, significant that is coming up. The uh, re-establishing of the global supply chains is also coming up. But of course, we've seen that many companies have opted out of China and into India and Vietnam, such as the big company, Apple. And we've also seen that the significance of Southeast Asia and India are also coming up in the economic development in all of the globe as well. Does this mean that there is a future of India in APEC, especially with the shift of US policy from Asia Pacific to Indo-Pacific? That's a question I'll leave the audience to. And of course, what it would imply for Pakistan as well. We'll be right after, uh, back after a short break and we'll talk more about India and what is happening in India with regards to FATF. Right, welcome back. We are going to talk about India and FATF, of course. The violent extremist groups in India are contacting and collecting funds from the crime groups and organized networks as well, according to the new report by FATF. And this could bring India in the limelight of FATF's blacklist. And of course, India was bolstering about the uh, development, which they called, and of course, the regressive attitude of Pakistan in FATF as well, after Pakistan was placed in the gray area. But we've seen how Pakistan came out of the gray area as well. But now India is in trouble. And of course, we can see karma playing at full over here as well. FATF, of course, uh, will take address of all these crimes that are happening over there. Modi's government is under distress as well, because the upcoming elections in 2024 are, of course, going to be impacted by that as well. In the performance of the RSS and but of course the BJP uh, in fact as well but let's go towards our analysts for further questions as well uh, how do we decode this latest FATF report regarding the violent crimes that of course are happening in the organized uh, groups that are giving the funds to these uh, violent crimes so uh, Taiba, this uh, whole FATF review and the team that FATF is sending to India to basically uh, gauge the financial frameworks of India. This hmm. is a long time coming hmm. because there have been like a lot of like international reports that basically stay, uh, state that a lot of like uh, bank accounts in India over 43 percent of their GDP they are informal. Hmm. So there's like a lot of like lack of transparency when it comes to India's financial frameworks. Hmm. Other than that, when Pakistan was under review and when the FATF team basically came, they basically gave Pakistan 27 questions to answer. And through that, they basically develop if the country is like at risk for uh, anti-money laundering or other. As comparison, they have like given India around 330 questions mm. as compared to Pakistan's 27 questions. Right. And those uh, recommendations that came out of these questions, Pakistan implemented all of them very efficiently, and they overhauled their whole uh, financial framework according to in line with the guidance of the FATF. Now this team is now going to India because there have been a lot of reports from international watchdog that basically look at terrorist, terrorist organizations as well. There are a lot of extremist organizations in India have very strong linkages with political parties over there. When we were like growing up, we all already knew there were like a lot of conspiracy theories and you must be um, in aware of that as well that the uh, extremist organizations mm -hmm. in India have like very strong linkages with politicians. They have very strong linkages with their movie industry as well. 
there's a very uh, vibrant uh, gambling scene that like uh, uh, perpetuates in uh, the city of Mumbai. Hmm. There are like a lot of like connections between uh, international gold smuggling uh, and gold that is procured from a lot of like uh, um, sources in uh, Africa. Uh, South Africa hmm. and also South America as well. Right. So a lot of like international gold trade, uh, uh, trade is not the right word, gold, gold smuggling that takes place hmm. and perpetuates in the whole hmm. uh, economy of India. Hmm. So all of these loopholes in the economy that were long um, uh, ignored, I think, now FATF has basically uh, decided to send this team for a review to like check how the international uh, financial system in uh, India like operates. So this review uh, uh, had to happen in 2019. So it was postponed because of the whole uh, COVID crisis. Mm. And now uh, this will definitely be taking place. And mm. um, I think like India's uh, financial system will be in a very uh, consistent like magnifying glass of the right. Yeah, committee. Ms. Naila, we've seen that India was meant to be the rising global power. Many predicted that by 2030, India would be one of the top global powers in terms of economy. So let's talk about how the smuggling and the mafias and the gambling, of course, is coming up and anti-corruption is coming up and it's being taken notice by the international community as well. 10 million worth of gold smuggling is happening, as of course mentioned by Mr. Shahriar as well. But of course, 330 questions. How and will rather India be able to fulfill these questions and how will, we be, will they be able to do so? Well, that is for India to worry about. <laughs> Uh, but you can see that 43% hmm. of India's GDP is through informal economy. Hmm. Uh, and if you look at their reserves, uh, about $4.2 trillion have been uh, placed there out of uh, illegal, uh, illegally. Hmm. So, uh, it, uh, but you must keep in mind that India is five times Pakistan's hmm. size. It is a large economy mm. and uh, the vested interests in the West uh, have always been trying to promote India mm. as a big power, trying to bring it as a counter to China. But uh, there is no match. Mm. And this FATF uh, report is really bringing that reality check. Mm. How far can India rise up to that mm. uh, competition that US is mm. talking about? and? Like we were earlier on speaking about, you know, uh, the Indo-Pacific politics and the Quad and uh, how they are trying to curtail China. They cannot curtail China. It is unrealistic because they themselves are facing problem. And India definitely doesn't have that uh, material mm. to be a global power. It w it's just being built for a certain interest, certain design. If you remember, the last Commonwealth Games were held in India. Uh, they were disappointed, even there were no bathrooms hmm. for the athletes, and they were trying to compete with, uh, you know, the Beijing Olympics. Hmm. There was no comparison, and yet the world tends to forget the reality of India hmm. and tries to, you know, magnify it in a glorify it. Hmm. But the FATF report uh, is. They had been postponing it, hmm. but now and it, it has come at a very critical point because India is now going into elections, hmm. and Modi government has been implicated in financing terrorist activities across the world. Yes. We had always been saying that they are funding terrorist activities in Pakistan, hmm. and, and Canada uh, recently. But this Canada event and then other activities also. The Sikh, uh, how they are, uh, you know, active now. What's happening in Kashmir? What's happening in all over? You know, India has many issues to deal with, hmm. but uh, this is a very delicate moment for India hmm. uh, because they are going into elections. So it's a big blow to, I think, the Modi government. Right, it's a big blow to the Modi government, and of course, he has been linked with many. 
terrorist activities, uh, of course, indirectly as well, many smuggling and corruption uh, activities as well. We saw the Adani case. We currently saw the allegations by Canada on India as well regarding Narjeet Singh. We also saw many other activities such as the minority issues that are happening currently in the Nagzalite movement. And what else, what not uh, rather, there, there's so many things coming up during the election process, which will happen in 2024. Dr. Hasnan, how significant is this uh, illegal uh, review? Of course, uh, the illegal actions of India uh, that have come under the review of FATF. How significant it is for the elections of BJP and, of course, Modi himself? Um, to be honest, uh, it will not affect any more uh, on this uh, matter because the whole world uh, knows already, I mean, that is the informal economy is more than 43 percent. Uh, believe in me, it is more than 70 percent of the informal economy and how they uh, the Indian uh, cricket board has been uh, run all by the gambling and everything which has been uh, discussed. But the key finding of the, of the FATF report against India is very much interesting. If, if you allow me. So uh, the violent extremist, uh, extremist organization under the investigation in the India collected fund through well-structured networks. So well-structured networks mean it has been noticed that the India is a well-structured network in the whole of this area. So including offline and online uh, uh, fundraising mechanism, such as uh, uh, circulating QR codes and account details and lease report by the financial action task force has started. So the source is also said that the Rashtriya Swayam Sivak Sang, what we call it RSS. I'm a little, uh, I, I, I have difficulty to Swayam Sivak Sang, so RSS, which is directly controlled by the Modi government, is spreading violence and terrorists around the world. Uh, so the source also said that the Modi government get money from the illegal business to give to the terrorist group. And source also says the Mumbai India has become the country's biggest uh, gaming city. So they also say that India is the leader in the money laundering and smuggling, drug trafficking, human trafficking, and having an unofficial business account. So India GDP is made up of the 43, which is uh, which I already told you, it is more than 70 percent of the informal account. And the report says that the more than the 4.2 trillion dollar in the India's reserve have been illegally gained. So this is very much crucial and the focus and the alarming area. So India is the fourth most unorganized economy in the world. According to the new study, uh, this non-traditional area is one way of that Modi government support terrorism around the world, not just in India. So India is also, con uh, also involved in the smuggles the most gold, and it was caught in the France that an India group was moving money and 10 million euros were uh, taken back from the India money laundering network there. So this is very much important as they have uh, smuggled the gold and the 10 million euros of the uh, euros from uh, uh, through the money laundering. So over uh, 228.42 billion Indian rupee were uh, laundered in ABG uh, shipyard bank fraud and 2 billion Indian rupees were laundered in the Punjab National Bank scam. So increase or rate of the smuggling, money laundering and terrorism in India will prove very serious for the entire region. So what you are asking is that, that uh, whatever the source says that the dot of the real estate fraud, smuggling, money laundering in India can be connected with the terrorism around the world. But your question is very much valid. Let me answer this, that all thing is providing a very uh, beneficial funding to the all uh, political parties of the India. So Modi getting much benefits out of it and they're giving the much benefit to, uh, to its uh, business, uh, uh, I mean, uh, quorum. So how, uh, there is no chance that M M Modi can be uh, damaged by any of the, uh, 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 any in the election time. So in my opinion, he will not get any dent by the dent in elections. An indent, which is a big question mark towards the morality and ethics of India in itself and the population of India, uh, bringing out the same leader who, of course, has been accused of terrorism and smuggling and money laundering as well, brings the question mark. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Hasnan Shahriyar. Thank you so much for joining us, Ms. Naila Chauhan, as well. Of course, uh, this topic was talking about how the 43% uh, of GDP of India was coming through money laundering, through corruption, through laundering, and all the uh, illegal transfer of money towards terrorist activities as well, which has finally come under limelight 
of the FATF review report as well, 330 questions. And this also shows us how the connection between big conglomerates such as the Adani group and Modi have been actually perpetrating violence against many minorities communities in India as well. That's a question mark that many people, such as World Economic Forum, were saying that India is projected to have more than $1 trillion economy by 2030. Is that the case? If this review continues, will we see India's rise in economy, especially with the question marks of money laundering and smuggling, and of course, the financing towards terrorism? That's another question I'd leave to the audience. Thank you so much for joining us, our esteemed guests, and thank you so much for watching us, the audience. And of course, do think about these questions, do think about what is happening in the world around you, and of course, how it implicates to Pakistan. Thank you for watching us. Take care. Allah Hafiz.